On behalf of the Department of Ancient Scripture, Religious Education at Brigham Young University and the Conference Committee, I would like to welcome you to the 2024 Easter Conference. It is our hope that this conference will aid in your focus on and devotion to the Savior this Easter weekend. We would like to acknowledge in attendance the Dean of Religious Education, Scott Esplin, and the Associate Deans, Tyler Griffin and Gay Strathern, as well as the Chair of Ancient Scripture, Sean Hopkin. We're grateful for their support, as we are grateful for the music provided by the BYU Women's Course, directed by Dr. Sonia Poulter. To open our conference, the Women's Course will favor us with This is the Christ. Following that, our invocation will be given by Dr. David Calibro, a faculty member from the Department of Ancient Scripture. Our dear Father in heaven, we, some of thy children, are gathered here this evening to celebrate the atoning sacrifice and the resurrection of thy son, Jesus Christ. And as we do so with words of inspiration and with song, we ask that thy spirit may be among us and with us at this time and we pray that those who speak and those who sing may be filled with thy spirit and that all of us 
who hear and participate with our hearts may also be filled with thy spirit and edified together. We pray that each of us in attendance today may have an increased testimony as we leave this meeting that we may understand better and have a, a surer knowledge of the resurrection of thy son and of the hope of our own resurrection. And we thank thee, dear Father, for thy sacrifice and that of thy son in bringing redemption and resurrection to each of us. And we also pray for peace in the world, especially in the land where Jesus suffered these things and rose again. And we also pray for those who are struggling in their faith that whether they are here or elsewhere, that they may have an increased testimony and grow in their knowledge as well. We pray these things and express our love to thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our first speaker this evening will be Dr. Lincoln Blumel. Dr. Blumel is a professor of ancient scripture here at Brigham Young University. He holds graduate degrees from the University of Calgary, University of Oxford, and University of Toronto. He specializes in early Christianity and Greek and Coptic papyrology and epigraphy. He is the author of three books, Lettered Christians, Christian Letters, and Late Antique Oxyrhynchus, Christian Oxyrhynchus, Text Documents and Sources, and Didymus the Blind's commentary on Psalms 26.10 to 29.2 and 36.1 through 3. He has a forthcoming book with the SBL Press in the series Writings from the Greco-Roman World on Christian education in late antique Alexandria, and another book with Fortress Press on an early woman leader in the New Testament. He has published more than 80 articles. He will speak to us this evening on Standing Again Through the Resurrection of Christ. Thank you, uh, George, uh, for that introduction, and it is really wonderful uh, to be here uh, this evening. I thank the Easter Committee for all the work uh, they've done, uh, the BYU's Women's Chorus. That was just uh, amazing, uh, very powerful way uh, to open up uh, this uh, conference. Um, as you may or may not be aware, there is a volume that comes along with uh, papers uh, from uh, this and previous Easter sessions. And I just want to make a, a note uh, there and recognize that uh, the submission that I have in there is a co-authored submission with uh, my TA, uh, Spencer Krauss, who has just been um, amazing. Um, he's here tonight, and um, unfortunately for me, he's graduating in three weeks. Um, fortunately for him, uh, going on to bigger and uh, better things, no doubt. And that's a, a challenge I have here at BYU as a professor. You meet all these amazing students. You are fortunate to have a few of them as TAs or RAs, but then they always leave. Uh, the good thing is, is that I always find you know, other students that come in and also do a really remarkable job. But uh, I wanted to acknowledge him um, with that uh, paper that was uh, presented um, there. The, the way I look at what I'm up to uh, here this evening is I kind of look at I'm like the cover band. I'm just kind of getting ready, right, for the main uh, speakers, really Crystal and Andy. So I'm just here to kind of warm up the crowd a little bit for a few minutes, and then they're really going to steal the show. And so um, and I'm really serious about that. I, I'm really excited for their words uh, that will uh, follow. Now, as I begin my brief remarks um, this evening, and I'm calling a little bit of an audible um, on this, um, I'm going to stray a little bit from the written uh, paper. Some of the topics will be the same, but I'm going to focus on a few different um, elements uh, there. It is I want to get some crowd interaction uh, as I begin. And I know when I've been to, you know, sacrament meetings and somebody gets up who is from Hawaii, they'll say aloha and everybody will say that uh, back. But I'm not from Hawaii, so I don't really feel good about uh, doing that. I'm from Canada. And so I thought, well, maybe I could say something like, How's everyone doing, A? Eh? And you could say, we're all doing well, A, eh? but that really does not, doesn't work uh, so well either. So what I want to do, and I think this will kind of set the tone for my remarks this evening, is I want to do the Paschal greeting. 
And what this greeting is, is in uh, the Greek Orthodox tradition, but also some other traditions, uh, they have a greeting and a response. Typically, this is done at Easter, but in fact, it could be done at any time uh, during uh, the year. And what you have is the person doing the greeting, right? And you're seeing all these squiggles up um, on the uh, slide uh, behind me, is the one doing the greeting will say, Christos Anesti. And then the person who gets that greeting will respond and say, Alethos Aneste. Now, what you have here, I'm sure all of you, whether you know Greek or not, probably know what the word Christos means. That's Christ. And so literally what some person says is, Christ is risen. And the respondent will then say, right, with Alethos Aneste is, truly, Christ is risen. And this is a uh, greeting uh, that is done. And so I would like to actually do this. I'm going to, everybody can try, try, you didn't think you were practicing some Greek here, but I thought this might be a nice way to begin. So I'm going to actually the first part, Christos Aneste, and then I'd like everybody to respond and say, Alethos Aneste. So here we go. I'll, I'll do this right here. So here we go, right? And I have it transliterated underneath. So Christos Aneste. All right, thank you. That was great, right? Truly Christ is risen. Um, very truly. And, and in fact, as you think about how important this event is, everything in the gospel stems back to that. In fact, I think of this quote that some of you I'm sure have heard of this uh, before, that talk about the centrality of the resurrection, but the atonement for, right, the gospel. And so I want to read this quote from Joseph Smith. The fundamental principles of our religion is the testimony of the apostles and prophets concerning Jesus Christ, that he died, was buried, and rose again the third day, and ascended up into heaven. And all other things are only appendages to these, which pertain to our religion. The resurrection is absolutely fundamental to the gospel. In fact, as I think about how fundamental this is, I think of the words of Paul, where he says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ is not risen, our faith is in vain or it is empty. However, if he is risen, it changes everything. It has eternal consequences. In fact, it shows that Jesus is precisely who he claimed to be, the Son of God and the Savior of the world. In fact, as I teach here uh, in religious education, and when I'm done right near the end of a semester, especially when I teach 211, which is the Gospels, I keep reminding the students how important the empty tomb is. It means everything. If there's an empty tomb, and I testify there was indeed an empty tomb, it has eternal implications for you. And this is why it all goes back to this empty tomb and the resurrection. Now, as you think about the resurrection, and I have, of course, to throw some more squiggles up on the screen, what you have here is the Greek word for resurrection literally is anastasis, which literally means to rise up or to rise again. And so as I talk about the resurrection, I notice that the theme here talks about the witnesses of the resurrection. I want to share my witness um, of that in some unique ways in my life. And I, I want to do this by begin, you know, talking about kind of the resurrection, first of all, as rising again. Everyone will rise again through the atonement of Christ. In fact, I, I think of what Amulek says, where he says, all shall be raised from this temporal death because of Christ, what he did through his resurrection. And as I was thinking about this and preparing uh, this talk, uh, not long ago, I was actually working on an inscription. In fact, I work on one of the things I do is I translate inscriptions typically from uh, Egypt or from other areas of the Greek and Roman worlds. This is an inscription I've been working on, translating, preparing it for publication. And it's just an epitaph. It's an epitaph for uh, two uh, women. And as I was working my way through this, um, in the home office, I was there with my wife, and when I finally, you know, cracked the two last lines, I started chuckling. And then I told my wife what this inscription said. So here's what it says, right? So it reads the last two lines, it reads, Melu pethes udes athanatos ento cosmo, which literally is, don't grieve, no one is immortal in this world. Right? So I don't know if this is really you know, reassuring, but off the ancient world you'll find these things, you know, death will fall upon everyone. And so I was thinking about, you know, this tombstone and thinking, well, what would I put on a tombstone if I wanted to reassure someone? I might say this, Melu pethes, don't grieve, Christos aneste, Christ is risen, all right? Because Christ is risen, all can be risen. And I think about the resurrection. You know, in my life, 
where this first of all really became a real thing for me is when I was 18 years old. And I want to share you a story that took place when I was 18 years old and actually is um, commemorated here on a blanket that I was given by uh, some friends, uh, parents. And so it's of a baseball game. And you'll see there out in left field, the number four. And I want to share an experience about this and how at a very hard time, I felt the power of the resurrection. I want to share my witness of that. So I was 18 years old. I was a senior in high school, played a lot of sports, played baseball, and was playing on a rep team. We were doing really well. And we went in Canada to the Nationals. So we were playing all these teams from other uh, regions. And so in the first game of the tournament, uh, we're playing a team. I was the center fielder. And uh, it starts to rain, right? And so the umpire calls the game. We all jog into the dugout. And we're kind of sitting there waiting for the game to resume. The rain eventually stops. We jog back onto the field. And I'm there with my uh, friend, who was number uh, four in left field, our center fielder. We're talking. We're warming up. We're about 20 feet away, just kind of tossing the ball back and forth, getting ready for the game to be resumed. And as we're doing this, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there, there was a huge crack. And the next thing I know, I was lying on my back. And I sat up, and I thought, what just happened? And I looked over, and my friend's hat had blown over to me. And his hat was completely shredded. And he had been hit by lightning and was instantaneously killed right in front of me, no more than 20 feet from me. And the whole stadium, there's all panic and all these things that were going on. Very tough circumstance, seeing his parents run onto the field. And really challenging, right? I remember going in the ambulance uh, to the hospital and learning that he was instantly killed. And at that point, it was a very hard time, right, for myself and for our team. But during that time, I felt in a very strong way the power of the resurrection. I knew that although one of my good friends was gone from me and taken literally in an instant, that I knew, and I had the Spirit confirm this to me, that I would see him again. And it was interesting, in the immediate aftermath, we had some crisis counselors come and were speaking to the team. And I, I'm not in any way diminishing what they do, because they do a very good thing. But it was interesting that I noticed, at least with me and some others, the thing that really mattered most was the Spirit, when people would feel the Spirit. In fact, we went to the hospital, and I remember a nurse coming to us and talking to us. And she wasn't a Latter-day Saint, but she basically bore her testimony of Christ and the resurrection. And her, me and a two teammate were in this room as it was going on, and I felt very powerfully the Spirit. I knew I'm going to see him again. He's going to be resurrected. And that helped me at a very, you know, um, young age, when I think I took much of life for granted, that you kind of think you're immortal. And then you realize very soon, no, life will have an end, maybe sooner than you think. But no matter when it ends, I know there is a resurrection and that all will rise up again. And so I really, at that point, I felt I really developed a testimony in the resurrection. Now, of course, we have, right, the resurrection, right, overcoming uh, physical death. But I think another aspect we think of with the resurrection, here I get to this meaning of rising up or standing again. I think here about the power of the atonement can help you overcome challenges and darkness or hardships in your life. As I think about this, I think about a conversation that Jesus had. It's recorded in John chapter 3 between him and Nicodemus. And they were uh, discussing... Uh, things. And one of the things Jesus says in John 3, 14, is he talked about how ancient Israel, right, in Numbers 21, they were afflicted by fiery servant, serpents. And to be healed, Moses put a brazen serpent up on a pole, and those who would look on it would be saved. And he uses kind of a typological, you know, uh, type for him. And of course, it's picked up in the Book of Mormon, as you know, with Alma speaks to his son Helaman, where he literally says, son, if you look to Christ, you will live. And he reminds him of this. And one of the things that I find, I think about the resurrection, just in this life, standing again in times of hardship and keeping your eyes focused on Christ. If you think in Matthew 14, when Jesus comes walking to the disciples on water at, during the fourth watch, uh, Peter asks if he can come and walk to him. And he does this. And it's interesting, Peter's able to do this, but then it says, when he looks around and sees, right, the wind boisterous and the waves, he begins to sink. He kind of, you know, moves his glance from the Savior. Of course, the Savior is there to help him. But I think a lesson that I take from this is keeping our eyes fixated on the Savior, and you can rise again even in hardship. I think we see this principle in the, you know, vision of the tree of life. Moving forward toward that, there may be people mocking. 
There may be mists of darkness. There may be paths that lead elsewhere. But if you keep your eyes focused on Christ, you can get through this. You can rise and stand again in hardship. You know, as I think about this principle of keeping your eyes focused on something, this reminds me of a story that I heard of a swimmer called, named Florence Chadwick who was a famous swimmer in the 1940s and 1950s. She was from California. And in 1952, she determined she wanted to be the first woman to swim from mainland California to Catalina Island, which is 22 miles away. And so she trained and set out to do that in 1952. And so she went out, there's a boat going next to her, and she started swimming. And during the course of her swim, a huge fog set in. And she could no longer see the island. It got very thick. And after 15 hours, she said, I have to give up. I can't do it. And so after 15 hours, she got in the boat. And it turned out that she was actually less than a mile away from Catalina Island. And in the aftermath, she was actually talking to a reporter. And she said, I don't want to make any excuses. But she said, if I could have seen that island, I would have made it. I would have pushed on. I would have gone 16 hours, and I would have made it. Well, interestingly enough, a couple of months later, she went and tried again, and she actually made it. In fact, she ended up swimming three times to Catalina Island. But I think it illustrates that principle of keeping your eyes fixated on the Savior and you can move forward. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I want to say is that sometimes in life, it's a certain kind of faith, right? You see the Savior, see what you need to do, and you can make it even though there might be mists of darkness and challenges. I think, you know, that's a certain kind of faith. I think there's another kind of faith in life where sometimes, and I feel that I've personally experienced this, where things are completely black, and you literally cannot see one step in front of another. And what my testimony is, is that in these times, if you will just keep moving, eventually light will emerge. And it will get brighter and brighter and brighter if you will do this. Now, I want to share an experience with you again, which is part of my testimony of the power of the resurrection. So uh, a few years ago, I was going through, I would say, without a doubt, the hardest time in my life because of circumstances. And literally, I just felt enveloped in total darkness and just pleading with the Lord for help as I tried to put one foot in front of the other. And during this time, I uh, took um, kids and we decided we were going to go out to the Olympic Peninsula. We were going to drive out there and spend a few days at the beach. And, you know, as I was driving the car right out there, just kind of constantly feeling, feeling this kind of this weight. And we got into Oregon, we're you know, going up the interstate, and I remember just saying, I just need to pull off at a rest stop. And so I pulled off at a rest stop there in kind of the middle of nowhere in Oregon. I said, kids, you know, go, here's some money, go to vending machine, you know, get some candy. I'll, I'll meet you back in the car. I just got to go for a quick walk here. And I saw, you know, a couple hundred yards away, as you see these rest stops, kind of some picnic tables and an area of trees. And I began walking over there. And, you know, no one was around. And I started saying, Lord, I really need your help. I, I'm literally in darkness. I need your help. And I was audibly saying this as I was walking on this path over to these picnic tables. And when I arrived at the picnic tables, I sat down and was just literally pleading the Lord for help. And I turned around and I looked over and this was sitting on the picnic table. This very copy it was sitting there in the middle of nowhere in Oregon as I went there. And I said, okay, I'm going to make it. I'm going to get through. I know what I'm going to do. And I took it and I keep it by my nightstand every night. And I look at it and I think, the Lord cares about me. And even in times of darkness, you can get through this. And for me, this is just another element, the power of the resurrection, the atonement. And by the way, there are no coincidences. There's no coincidence of all the rest stops. I stopped, middle of nowhere, and this was sitting on the picnic table as I walked out. And so I took that up and it did help me. And things got brighter. In fact, a very uh, wise person shared this quote with me. And I, I truly believe it and live by it. The future is as bright as your faith. In fact, I would say the future is as bright as your faith, and I might add, in Christ. Even in times of darkness, you can get through really hard, difficult things. As I conclude, a scripture that comes to mind that I want to share with you is Philippians 4.13. In the King James, it says, I can do all things through Christ, um, which strengtheneth me. Literally, it reads, I can do all things through him, it is Christ, who empowers me. Christ is power. He is the power of God. My testimony is not one that I can claim that I've seen the risen Lord, but I know absolutely I have felt the power of the risen Lord at some very, very trying times in my life. 
it came uh, to me and it helped me get through very dark times and I was literally able to stand again. And so I leave this testimony with you and do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Lincoln. Our next speaker this evening is someone near and dear to my heart, it's Dr. Crystal V.L. Pierce. Dr. Pierce is an assistant professor here in Ancient Scripture. She received her PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Cultures from UCLA after receiving her MA and BA in Egyptology at UC Berkeley. She's excavated with me at several archaeological sites in Israel and in Egypt and is currently the head registrar for the Tel Shimron excavations in the Galilee region of Israel. Her recent publications include the co-edited volumes, Excavations at the Sela Pyramid and the Fog El Gamos Cemetery through Brill, and Book of Mormon Insights, published through Deseret Book. She and I uh, have two children and live in Vineyard, Utah. Thank you, the other Professor Pierce. <laughs> good evening, sisters and brothers. I am happy to be spending this Good Friday with you, celebrating the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Tonight, I will be speaking about seeing, knowing, and recognizing the true identity of the risen Christ, and I hope that my testimony will help strengthen your faith in him. Jesus Christ appeared to hundreds of his followers over the 40-day period between his resurrection and ascension. But two specific groups were blessed to see and interact with the risen Christ first. On the morning after his resurrection, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene and other female disciples at the tomb, and then to Cleopas and another disciple traveling on the road to Emmaus. These two groups interacted with the resurrected Savior in varying ways, that made these experiences uniquely adapted for each group and even for each individual. Some were able to observe the spiritual power of Jesus and his sudden appearance in their midst, while others were able to observe his physical nature through feeling the wounds in his hands and feet. Even though the settings, people, locations, times, and interactions may have been different, the resurrected Savior personally appeared to and communicated with each group, teaching them about his identity as the risen Christ, correcting mistaken information, and providing them with instructions for the future. Surprisingly, the individuals in these groups, identified as his disciples, did not immediately recognize Jesus when he first appeared to them after his resurrection. They thought he might be a gardener, a stranger, or a passing traveler, clearly demonstrating that there was, and still is, an important difference between seeing someone and recognizing someone. Mary and Cleopas, along with the other disciples present at these appearances, physically saw and spoke to a man who was Jesus Christ with their physical eyes. However, they did not recognize his true identity until he opened their spiritual eyes and minds through visual, audible, and tangible signs and teachings. The behaviors and actions of these two groups after the death of the Savior indicated that they had certain expectations for the Lord. They expected him to continue to teach them until they understood the fullness of his gospel. They expected him to lead them as the head of his new earthly church. And they expected him to restore and redeem the kingdom of Israel as a warrior king. However, three days after his crucifixion, the disciples went to his tomb, also expecting to find the body of the deceased Jesus. These conflicting expectations led to feelings of sadness, disappointment, fear, and confusion. It was only through the personal appearance of the risen Christ to Mary and Cleopas, as well as other disciples, that their mistaken expectations were able to be corrected allowing the disciples to recognize the true identity, purpose, and significance of the resurrected Savior, and to react with feelings of joy, hope, peace, and clarity. 
As disciples of Christ, we have a lot in common with Mary and Cleopas. We all have certain inconsistent expectations of the Lord and his church, which, when they're not fulfilled according to our own limited mortal understanding, can at times hinder our view of the Savior, so that even when he is near enough for us to feel his presence and see him, we are not able to truly recognize him and the significant role he plays in our lives. If we study the ways that Jesus Christ was able to open the spiritual eyes and minds of his disciples in his appearances to them, we may also be able to correct our own mistaken expectations, recognize his true identity, meaning, and significance as our redeemer, and react with the same feelings of joy, hope, peace, and clarity. On the morning after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome, Joanna, and other female disciples went to the tomb to seek the crucified Jesus of Nazareth to anoint his body with oils and spices. Although they were seeking him with the righteous intent to serve the Lord through this anointing, they mistakenly expected to find his body still lying inside the tomb. Upon reaching the tomb and finding it empty, their expectations concerning the Lord were not fulfilled, which caused feelings of sadness and confusion, leading them to openly weep and assume that someone had taken or moved his body. Angels clothed in shining white soon appeared, sometimes with a countenance like lightning and accompanied by earthquakes, which added fear and panic to the disciples' already overwhelming feelings of sadness and confusion. The angels attempted to correct the mistaken expectations of Mary Magdalene and her companions by asking, why seek ye the living among the dead? These women were righteously seeking Jesus of Nazareth, but were looking in the wrong place. The angels continued, he is not here, but risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, the son of man must be delivered unto the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again? The women admitted to remembering these words of the Lord. However, their focus was set on the trial and crucifixion so that they lost sight of the most important aspect, that he would rise again. The angels explained to the women that Jesus was not in the tomb where deceased people are found, but instead he would be among the living in the homeland of Galilee, continuing his work, if they looked for him there, in the right place, the angels promised the disciples would see him soon. Although the women still felt fear and apprehension, these feelings were now accompanied by amazement and joy. In the Gospel of John, the personal experience of Mary Magdalene at the tomb is recounted. After her interaction with the angels, she turned and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus, demonstrating that there is a difference between physically seeing Jesus and spiritually knowing Jesus. The Greek word translated as saw in this verse is connected to the word for watching a play at a theater. Mary was a spectator in the audience of this appearance of the Lord, passively watching the man on the stage but not fully understanding the meaning or purpose of what she was seeing. She knew she was near the tomb where she expected to find a gardener whom she identified as the man she was watching. It took only one specific word from the Lord for Mary to truly recognize him as the risen Christ. Jesus said to her, Mary, reciting her personal name, causing her to actively turn toward him and call him by his title, Rabboni, which means master or teacher. At this moment, Mary was transformed from a passive spectator watching a scene unfold to an active performer participating in a life-changing event. She did not recognize the Lord until she physically turned to him, symbolizing the dynamic change and active transition required for someone to develop a personal relationship with the Savior. Later, when she told the other disciples and apostles about this experience, she proclaimed, I have seen the Lord, 
with the Greek word for seeing here, referring not only to seeing with physical eyes, but also to seeing with a spiritual perception that leads to comprehension. Hearing the Savior call her name and then actively turning toward him allowed her to grasp a divine spiritual truth from a mortal physical level. However, Mary still identified Jesus according to her own earthly expectations of him as her Rabboni, or teacher. She expected Jesus to continue to be physically present in her life, personally instructing her about his gospel until she and the other disciples could reach a full understanding. The Lord then instructed Mary to touch me not, with the Joseph Smith translation altering the verse to hold me not, clarifying that the Greek word referred not just to touching, but the more powerful clinging, grasping, gripping, or clutching. The Savior was explaining to Mary that he will not always be physically present for her to cling to in her learning and understanding of the gospel, but instead will be spiritually present as she takes an active position in studying and growing in knowledge herself. The Lord would always be her Rabboni and teacher, but she would soon need to take the initiative to seek his presence through the Spirit for further comprehension. According to the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus also only spoke one word to the other female disciples that led to their realization that he was the risen Christ. He called out all hail or greetings to them, a word connected with the Greek root for rejoicing or gladness. These disciples then went to the Lord, fell at his feet, and worshipped him, demonstrating the connections between seeing and recognizing the Savior, worshipping, and rejoicing. These feelings of joy, hope, and jubilation that resulted from recognizing the true identity of the Lord were a major shift from the earlier feelings of sadness, fear, and confusion associated with mistaken expectations. President Reina Ayaberto has testified that through the redeeming atonement and glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, broken hearts can be healed, anguish can become peace, and distress can become hope. He can embrace us in his arms of mercy, comforting, empowering, and healing each of us. These interactions with the resurrected Christ led Mary Magdalene and the other female disciples at the tomb to personally share their experiences with the other disciples and the apostles. As disciples of Christ, we also sometimes have mistaken expectations for the Savior or our spiritual path through life, which can result in disappointment and confusion. Many times, we have a righteous intent and purpose, like the female disciples going to the tomb to seek Jesus, but we're looking in the wrong place or beyond the mark and lose sight of or fail to recognize the real identity of the risen Christ. There are also angels around us reminding us of his words and where to look for him, including seeking him in his home, the house of the Lord. If we look for him there, we will not only feel his presence, but learn how to recognize him in our own lives. Like Mary, we must carefully listen for him to call our name, and we must actively turn toward him, not passively clinging like a spectator, but carefully listening to the Spirit to become a dynamic participant in our own gospel learning and knowledge. Then we might also experience the rejoicing, hope, and jubilation that results from a comprehension of and personal relationship with our Redeemer, leading us to share our faith in Jesus Christ with others. Later in the day, after the appearance of Jesus Christ to Mary Magdalene and other female disciples at the tomb, two disciples were walking on the road from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus. These disciples, one named Cleopas, who may have been a brother-in-law of Jesus' mother, and the other unnamed, were talking, communing, and reasoning over the death of Jesus of Nazareth. Some of the Greek root words for these types of communication were commonly connected with disputations and arguments, along with feelings of uncertainty and re resentment. The disciples clearly had certain expectations for Jesus, whom they trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. But instead of saving or restoring their land and people as a powerful warrior or king, Jesus had been put on trial, 
condemned, crucified, and laid in a tomb. These mistaken and unfulfilled expectations left the disciples feeling sadness, confusion, and bitterness, leading them to publicly deliberate and dispute with each other about how and why this happened. As they were walking on the road, Jesus came near to them, heard their conversation, and began walking with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Although they were his disciples, knew of the events of his life, were concerned about what had happened to him, and may have even been related to him, their physical eyes were not able to know or recognize his true identity as the resurrected Christ. The Greek word translated as know in this verse expresses the idea of experiential knowledge through a direct relationship and is used to describe the bond between Heavenly Father and his Son, as well as how much the Savior personally knows us. Although Cleopas and the other disciple were followers of Jesus, they had not yet fully developed an innate personal relationship with the Savior that allowed them to truly see and recognize him with both physical and spiritual eyes. Commenting on their sad demeanors, Jesus requested to know what events the two disciples were discussing. Cleopas was shocked that the man did not seem to know what had happened over the past few days and assumed that he must be only a stranger in Jerusalem. After Jesus questioned further, the disciples remarked that they were speaking of Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word. Not only had Cleopas and the other disciple misidentified Jesus as a stranger, but they had also now characterized him primarily as a prophet who performed important works rather than as the Christ. They admitted that they had trusted that Jesus of Nazareth would become a redeemer of Israel, but that his death three days ago had led to confusion and disappointment. These two disciples had expected Jesus to not only continue his role as a prophet, performing miracles and teaching the gospel, but also to be physically present to victoriously save and restore the kingdom of Israel from its conquerors and enemies as a warrior king. Instead, they thought that these same conquerors and enemies had defeated him through death. Jesus then responded that they were behaving foolishly, remarking that he knew Cleopas and the other disciple had heard and read the teachings of the prophets about the Christ, yet were slow to believe and understand them. He reminded them that they had the correct information about what to accurately expect of the Savior, through the spoken and written words of the prophets, yet they had not focused on diligently studying and comprehending these teachings. He reminded them that these prophets had distinctly prophesied that the Redeemer of Israel would go through suffering and death as integral components of the plan to enter into his glory. Jesus then accompanied the two disciples on their seven-mile journey to Emmaus, while sharing and expounding all the words of the prophets and scriptures concerning the Christ, beginning with Moses. Even though Cleopas and the other disciple had not recognized Jesus, had misidentified him as a stranger, had mistaken expectations for him, and had not carefully studied the words of the prophets or scriptures, Jesus compassionately walked with them for hours, listening to their concerns, teaching them about the gospel, correcting inaccurate ideas, and showing them how to properly study and interpret scripture. Nevertheless, the disciples still did not recognize him. When the group arrived in Emmaus, Cleopas and his companion kindly invited the stranger to come inside and dine with them. While sitting with them, Jesus took some bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. These two disciples were finally able to recognize the Lord through participating in the ordinance of the sacrament, which symbolized the vast knowledge they had just been taught about the crucified and resurrected Savior by the risen Christ himself. They were finally able to know him through first having their minds spiritually opened to the truths found in the writings of the prophets and the scriptures on the road, and then having their eyes spiritually opened through the symbols and signs of the sacrament in Emmaus. An act of kindness toward a stranger 
resulted in a powerful understanding of the Lord's own compassionate sacrifice. The two disciples admitted that they had felt something burning in their hearts earlier while the man walked and talked with them, but did not acknowledge or act on the feeling at the time. Although they had spent hours listening to and learning from the Savior and felt the Spirit testifying boldly to them, they had been passive spectators, watching a stranger speak about the scriptures instead of actively listening to the Spirit and participating in their own spiritual growth and learning. However, the process of learning about the scriptures, joining in the ordinance of the sacrament, and recognizing the Spirit enabled them to attain a higher level of gospel knowledge even with previously mistaken and unfulfilled expectations. President Henry B. Eyring has remarked, if we pay close attention to those moments when our hearts burn within us, our eyes can be opened and we will see his hand in our lives. Like the female disciples, this experience with the resurrected Christ led Cleopas and the other disciple to immediately return to Jerusalem and seek out the 11 apostles to share what Jesus had taught them about the scriptures and partaking in the sacrament with him. While they were speaking with the apostles in Jerusalem, Jesus suddenly appeared in the middle of them, saying, Peace be unto you. But because they assumed he must be a spirit, they became terrified, afraid, and troubled. Even though they had just interacted with the resurrected Christ in several physical ways, watching him walk, talk, and prepare, and partake of the sacrament, they had also watched him abruptly vanish and now reappear among them, even behind closed doors. They believed and recognized that this person was their leader and teacher, Jesus, who had been crucified, but expected a deceased man, especially one with unexplainable mobility, to only exist in spirit form. The Savior corrected their mistaken expectations through inviting them to personally come to him and touch his hands and his feet so they could see he had a body of flesh and bones. They had already spent hours seeing the resurrected Christ, yet it took Cleopas and the other disciple the movement of actively going to the Savior and tangibly experiencing him to recognize and comprehend his true spiritual and physical identities. Their leader, teacher, and redeemer would not always be physically present among them, but would always be spiritually among them through the ordinance of the sacrament, which symbolized the broken and resurrected body they had just experienced. He may not remain with them there, but he had provided a way for them to remain with him every time they prepared, blessed, and partook of the sacrament. Jesus connected these teachings to the fulfillment of the law of Moses and the prophecies about him, enabling the disciples to better understand the concepts of repentance and the remission of sins through the crucifixion and resurrection of the Christ. Jesus then instructed the disciples to go and preach the gospel in his name, promised them that they would be endowed with power from on high, lifted his hands and blessed them, and then ascended into heaven. The hours spent learning about the scriptures, listening to the spirit, performing service, partaking of the sacrament, and focusing on the Savior led to spiritual power and blessings for the disciples of the Lord, who felt great joy and returned to Jerusalem so they could be continually in the temple praising and blessing God. The disciples knew they could continue to seek and learn about the Redeemer through visiting the temple and sharing his gospel with others. Their initial feelings of sadness, confusion, and despair that resulted from mistaken expectations had been replaced by the joy, clarity, and hope that comes from a true knowledge of and relationship with the resurrected Lord. Like Cleopas and the other disciple on the road to Emmaus, we also sometimes feel like our expectations for the Savior, our faith, or our lives are not fulfilled, especially according to our own limited mortal understanding. The negative feelings that can result from these unfulfilled expectations occasionally cause us to dispute with others or even contend within ourselves instead of feeling the message of peace that the Lord is trying to bring us. These issues can also blind us from seeing or recognizing the presence of Jesus Christ, acknowledging the spirit, 
and comprehending what his sacrifice and resurrection really mean to us. Jesus spent hours with his disciples, walking with them, listening to their concerns, explaining scriptures to them, teaching the gospel, and preparing blessing and offering the sacrament to them. We can also spend hours with the Savior in much the same ways, through reading his words, performing acts of service, studying the scriptures, listening to the living prophets, partaking of the sacrament, sharing the gospel with others, and spending time in the temple. Although he may not be physically present here with us now, he has provided innumerable opportunities for us to personally see him, recognize him, know him, and be near to him. The disciples Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome, Joanna, Cleopas, and others were some of the first individuals to see the risen Jesus Christ. Their experiences with the earliest appearances of the resurrected Savior had some similarities, demonstrating that his compassion and gospel are universally for all people, but also had some differences, showing that our Redeemer knows each one of us personally and knows what we need individually. Some of the disciples in both groups were not named. This anonymity allows us to see ourselves as these unnamed disciples to place ourselves in their positions, examine their behaviors, and learn from their distinct experiences so that when he returns, we will be prepared to recognize and welcome him. What can we learn from their experiences so that we will recognize him when he is among us? One of the foremost consistencies among these appearances of the resurrected Christ was the compassion and empathy of the Savior toward his disciples. When they were disappointed, confused, and felt lost, he first sent angels to help them and then personally appeared to them himself, bringing them rejoicings and peace, calling them by name and inviting them to come to him. He was misidentified as a gardener and a stranger, yet carefully listened to their griefs, doubts, and pains, spending hours talking and walking with them. In much the same way, he is consistently a part of our own journeys through life, especially when we are feeling disappointed, lost, or confused. The atonement of Jesus Christ has given him a perfect understanding and knowledge of our hearts, minds, and spirits, enabling him to help us on an individual and personal level. Like Mary and Cleopas, we only need to listen for him to call our name actively turn toward him, acknowledge the spirit, and go to him when we need support. Jesus used specific teachings and activities to help the disciples understand his true resurrected identity and role as the redeemer. The angels reminded the female disciples of the Savior's words and that he would be found in his home, while Jesus spoke with the disciples on the road to Emmaus for hours about the writings of the prophets in the scriptures. We too can seek Jesus Christ in his home, including the numerous temples and chapels on the earth today, as well as study the writings of the prophets to learn about the eternal nature of the Savior. Beginning with his role in the creation, guidance as Jehovah, ministry on the earth, second coming, and millennial reign. We are also additionally blessed to hear the contemporary words of living prophets who lead and instruct us according to what we need in our own latter days. If we can study, understand, and remember these writings and teachings of the prophets and the scriptures, we can better be prepared to recognize Jesus Christ when he comes again. Performing acts of service and kindness also laid a foundation for Mary, Cleopas, and the other disciples to recognize the Savior. Mary and the female disciples at the tomb came to anoint his body, while Cleopas and the other disciple invited a stranger inside to share a meal. Our own service and kindness to others can help us emulate and truly understand the compassionate nature of the Lord, whose atonement, crucifixion, and resurrection were performed as acts of perfect mercy, charity, and love. We can also serve others through sharing his gospel, as the disciples at the tomb and on the road immediately rushed to do after their experiences with the Savior. While Jesus would always be there and our spiritual leader and teacher, He instructed them and us to take on the roles of the earthly leaders of his church and teachers of his gospel. 
He has promised us that when we are sharing the gospel in his name, he will be with us always. Some of the disciples were able to experience the Savior tangibly through physical interactions and feeling the wounds in his hands and feet. We have not had these opportunities yet, but he has provided a way for us to remember the sacrifice of his body and blood through the signs and symbols of the ordinance of the sacrament. Preparing, blessing, and partaking of the bread and water enables us to tangibly know him, take on his name, and invite his spirit to be with us. Mary, Cleopas, and the other disciples learned from their experiences that they needed to take an active role in their faith and growth in spiritual knowledge. Mary had to listen carefully for him to call her name and then physically turn toward him, while Cleopas had to listen carefully to the Spirit and then physically go to the Lord. Like the disciples, we must also not be passive spectators in our spiritual journey to develop a personal relationship with the Savior, but rather active participants because he wants us to diligently work to know him as well as he knows us. Studying the experiences of the first individuals to see the risen Christ has taught us where to seek him, what to look for, who can help us, and why understanding his true identity and purpose is so important. I truly believe that we are on the same journey as the disciples at the tomb and on the road. Righteously seeking him in times of sadness, doubts, and despair, and finding him with joy, faith, and hope. I testify that like them, our persistence and diligence can help us grasp divine spiritual truths from mortal physical levels so that we can be prepared to welcome him when he returns, truly recognizing him and acknowledging him. I testify of these things in his name, Jesus Christ, amen. We will now have a brief intermission. Restrooms and drinking fountains are available on all three floors of this building. They're located in the center of the building near the elevators or stairs. We will resume promptly at 10 minutes after 8. As prophesied, here we are at 10 after the hour. <laughs> Wish to welcome you back. <clears throat> to begin this portion of our conference, the women's chorus will sing, I want to walk as a child of light. After the choir's number, we'll be pleased to hear from Dr. Andrew Skinner, our keynote speaker. Dr. Skinner is an emeritus professor of ancient scripture uh, from here at BYU. He earned his BA degree in history from the University of Colorado. He earned an MA degree from the Isle of School of Theology in Jewish Studies and a THM degree from Harvard in Biblical Hebrew. He did graduate work at Hebrew University in Jerusalem and earned a PhD from the University of Denver in Near Eastern and European History specializing in Judaism. He has served as the director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship, Dean of Religious Education, Chair of Ancient Scripture, and the Academic Director at the BYU Jerusalem Center for Ancient Near Eastern Studies. He is the author or co-author of more than 100 publications. He will address us this evening regarding witnesses of the resurrection. Following Dr. Skinner's remarks, the women's chorus will sing for us how firm a foundation.
Well, it seems hardly fair to make a person speak after that music. Uh, it's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Professor Pierce for that introduction. Emeritus is an interesting word. If uh, you attended last year's Easter celebration, Elder Richard Hinckley, an emeritus member of the 70, addressed the question about what it means. I guess his grandson said to Grandpa, what does it mean to be emeritus? And he said, well, it's a foreign word, and it means dinosaur. <laughs> and uh, I'm the dinosaur speaker tonight. I'm uh, just waiting for the eventuality. I know someone is going to come up to me someday and say, you know, my grandmother had you for a teacher. Wow. Thank you for coming, and thanks to those who have hosted us. It's been great. Uh, as is noted, uh, my remarks uh, address the topic of witnesses of the Redeemer. On cloudless nights, when I can look up into the heavens and see the vastness of creation shining in the sky, my thoughts often turn to scripture passages that extol God's creative power. You can hardly blame me for that. I taught scripture for 35 years at BYU. As the psalmist said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Moses chapter 1 verse 33 mentions the worlds without number that Jesus created under the direction of his father. And Moses, chapter 7, verse 30, proclaims that millions of earths like this one would not be a beginning to the number of God's creations. These witnesses to the number and complexity of our Lord's creations are staggering. But what moves me even more is the com companion truth that Jesus Christ redeems all all that he creates, according to section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Through him, through Jesus Christ, physical redemption, that is, resurrection comes to everyone and everything that has been created physically, whether human beings or animals or the earth itself. True it is that complete or comprehensive redemption in the celestial kingdom comes only to those entities that have lived in harmony with God's celestial laws. However, lest we diminish the power of the resurrection, we must, must remember that resurrection alone is redemption for all human beings, whether good or bad or in between. Alma taught that, quote, the wicked remain as though there had been no redemption made except it be the loosing of the bands of death, unquote. Thus, the resurrection is the exception to the rule that the wicked receive no redemption. The loosing of the bands of death or resurrection constitutes a form of redemption. I reiterate Resurrection is redemption. The prophet Nephi framed his testimony in more positive sounding terms, but the doctrine is the same. Resurrection is redemption. To fulfill the merciful plan of the great creator, there must needs be a power of resurrection, he says, and the resurrection must needs come unto man by reason of the fall, and because man became fallen, they were cut off from the presence of the Lord. This corruption could not put on incorruption, and if so, this flesh must have laid down to rot and to crumble to its mother earth to rise no more. For behold, if the flesh should rise no more, our spirits must become subject to that angel who fell from before the presence of the eternal God and became the devil to rise no more. 
and our spirits must have become devils, angels to a devil. Oh, how great the goodness of our God, who openeth the way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster, death and hell. I repeat, resurrection is redemption. Our beloved past prophet, President Howard W. Hunter, testified powerfully about the resurrection when he said, quote, the doctrine of the resurrection is the single most fundamental and crucial doctrine in the Christian religion. It cannot be overemphasized, nor can it be disregarded. Jesus' triumph over physical and spiritual death is the good news every Christian tongue should speak. And I would add, speak again and again and again. I affirm that even the most skeptical among us may rest assured that the resurrection of Jesus Christ did happen. Non Latter day Saint prophet, excuse me, professor, might be a prophet now. <laughs> non Latter day Saint professor Bruce Metzger's thoughtful assertions as a distinguished member of the academic community bolster our faith in the historicity of the resurrection. Quote The evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is overwhelming. Nothing in history is more certain than that the disciples believed that after being crucified, dead, and buried, Christ rose again from the tomb on the third day, and that intervals thereafter he met and conversed with them. The most obvious proof is the existence of the Christian church. A brief survey of selected witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ may provide us with instructive insights. The first of these is the earth itself. In fulfillment of Zenos' prophecy that the earth would groan and the rocks of the earth would rend because of the death of the God of nature, Matthew reported that when Jesus died, quote, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rend. Samuel the Lamanite in Helaman chapter 14 verses 21 to 23 also prophesied that the time, at the time that Jesus yielded up the ghost, the earth would shake and tremble and the seismic calamity would be much worse than Zenos' prophecy may have intimated. Samuel the Lamanite prophesied and many graves shall be opened and shall yield up many of their dead, and many of the saints shall appear unto many. That's Helaman 14, verse 25. Indeed, the Gospel of Matthew describes this same scene envisioned by Samuel the Lamanite. Matthew also tells us that another great or violent earthquake occurred when Jesus was resurrected. And it would have been this second earthquake when, as Matthew testified, the other graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Matthew's account is unique among the gospels. Only Matthew reports the two earthquakes when the earth itself bore witness to both the death and resurrection of its creator, heaving to and fro, honoring his infinite and eternal sacrifice and signaling that a new and different age had arrived when the unprecedented power of resurrection was inaugurated. Matthew's report of the resurrection is supported and strengthened by restoration scripture. The great seer Enoch 
saw that the earth acted as a living witness to the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, as well as the resurrection of the first group of saints in history. Enoch testified that after the earth cried out for redemption and witnessed the Messiah's resurrection, quote, saints arose and were crowned at the right hand of the Son of Man with crowns of glory as many of the righteous spirits as were in prison came forth and stood on the right hand of God and the remainder were reserved in chains of darkness until the day of judgment of the great day, until the judgment of the great day. Significantly, the book of Enoch that is part of the Apocrypha is in harmony with the book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price and also asserts that, quote, the just shall rise from their sleep and be judged. Obviously then, other witnesses to the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus included that group of righteous saints who were themselves resurrected right after their master's resurrection. There is some confusion in the world about this passage in Matthew and the identity of the saints or the holy ones who arose. But the Book of Mormon saves us from confusion and speculation. The prophet Abinadi testified that they were all the prophets and all those that have believed in their words or all those that have kept the commandments of God, those that had lived from the time of our first parents up to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Abinadi continued, they are the first resurrection. They are raised to dwell with God who has redeemed them. Thus they have eternal life through Christ. In 1918, President Joseph F. Smith saw in vision these souls assembled in the paradise of God, awaiting the advent of the Son of God into the spirit world to declare their redemption from the bands of death, declaring liberty to the captives who had been faithful. President Smith mentioned some of these individuals by name, beginning with Father Adam, and glorious Mother Eve, as well as several other successive prophets. As mentioned in Doctrine and Covenants, section 133, verse 55, John the Baptist was in this group. Apparently, translated beings, such as Moses and Elijah, were also part of this assembly of pre-Meridian disciples awaiting this first resurrection and were with Christ in his resurrection. All these eyewitnesses of Christ's resurrection, some of whom went into Jerusalem and appeared unto many, according to Matthew, must have been a stunning occurrence. Can you imagine seeing someone who you knew had passed on now coming into Jerusalem and their physical pre presence standing in front of you? Surely, this changed at least some former skeptics into believers, just as Christ's appearance after his resurrection to his half-brother James changed him from a non-believer into an eyewitness of the resurrection and then a prominent leader in the church and the branch of the church at Jerusalem. The list of eyewitnesses is uh, the list of eyewitnesses to our Lord's resurrection is substantial. Chief among them were the early apostles. They were commissioned by Jesus to be witnesses of his resurrected living reality, according to Luke chapter 24 and Acts chapter 1. Their eyewitness certitude of Jesus' resurrection was the doctrinal foundation of the early church. The criterion for selecting a new member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles to replace Judas Iscariot after the resurrection of Jesus was that the individual must be ordained to be a witness with us of Jesus' resurrection. The number of times 
the apostles declared themselves to be witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ constitutes an important theme in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Early on, after Jesus' ascension, Peter, the chief apostle, spoke on behalf of the entire quorum, his quorum, on the day of Pentecost. Quote, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. There are other examples like this. Paul of Tarsus is perhaps prominent. Paul or Saul of Tarsus testified that the early apostles were witnesses of the crucifixion and resurrection as he taught people during his first missionary journey. He said, God raised Jesus from the dead. For many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses. Ultimately, Paul spoke of his own call to be a witness of the risen Lord when he was back in Jerusalem after his third missionary journey. Standing on the steps of the Antonia Fortress, which is called the castle in Acts chapter 21, Paul said, And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law of Moses, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there in Damascus, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked upon him, and he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, for thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. Now, brothers and sisters, the foregoing examples confirm the importance of the apostolic eyewitnesses of Jesus' literal resurrection in the Church of Jesus Christ of the Meridian Dispensation. And as has earlier been noted, as it was in days of old, so it still is today, as the prophet Joseph Smith said, quote, the fundamental principles of our religion are the testimony of the apostles and prophets concerning Jesus Christ, that he died, was buried, rose again the third day, and ascended into heaven, and all other things which pertaining to our religion are only appendages to it. In these latter days, the restoration of authorized living apostles and prophets possessing authentic witness of Jesus' bodily resurrection began with Joseph Smith's first vision. President Ezra Taft Benson I think we want to go back one. President Ezra Taft Benson said that the appearance of God the Father and his son Jesus Christ to the boy prophet is the greatest event that has occurred in this world since the resurrection of the master. The prophet Joseph saw and heard the father and the son, and so became a living witness of the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Others would follow, but he was the first in this last dispensation of the fullness of times. The prophet Joseph Smith taught us much about resurrection, especially by simply bringing forth the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon serves as a divine tutorial on the doctrine of the resurrection. An aspect of that doctrine that is uniquely taught in the Book of Mormon is the relationship between resurrection and restoration. The resurrection is a perfect manifestation of a larger law, the law of restoration. Resurrection is a restoration of the spirit to the body. In the resurrection, all things shall be restored to their proper and perfect frame, according to Alma chapter 40, verse 23. Resurrection is but one aspect of the restoration of all things, physical and spiritual, as taught by Alma, who referred to God's plan as, quote, the plan of restoration. Resurrection illustrates beautifully the justice and order 
of the restoration of all things. In the resurrection, each person is called forth by that law to which he or she has chosen to give allegiance. Those choosing to live the celestial law will be called forth as called forth um, in the celestial resurrection. Those who choose to live a terrestrial standard will come forth in the terrestrial resurrection and so forth. The resurrection, the order of resurrection is from most righteous to most wicked. Christ is the first fruits of them that slept and the sons of perdition will be the last. Were it not for Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon, we would not possess such clarity about the law of restoration and its relationship to resurrection. Of special importance is the way the Book of Mormon describes how each and every soul, 2,500 of them, also became eyewitnesses of the Savior's literal resurrection. Upon his post-resurrection visit to the new world, he invited the multitude who had gathered at the temple in the land bountiful to come forward and thrust their hands into his side and feel the nail prints in his hands and his feet so that each individual would know for themselves that he, Jesus Christ, was the God of Israel, their very God and the God of the whole earth and had been slain for the sins of the world just as he had introduced himself moments before. The Book of Mormon mentions two other powerful prophets who received personal visitations by Jesus Christ, the father and son dynamic duo prophets, Mormon and Moroni. The latter stated that Jesus talked with him face to face and spoke to him in plain humility, even as a man telleth another. It wasn't a servant, a master communication. It was person to person in plain humility, one of the tremendous attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ. In these latter days, Jesus Christ has appeared to a documented list of witnesses among the earliest and most inspiring visitations is the one described by the prophet Joseph in section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants. You all know the words. You could probably recite them better than me. And now, after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony, last of all, which we give of him, that he lives, for we saw him even on the right hand of God. Keeping in mind those words from 1832, fast forward in time to our day, to the testimony of another special witness. Speaking in General Conference, October 2014, President Boyd K. Packer, President of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, concluded his address, which was entitled, The Witness, with this comment. After all the years that I have lived and taught and served, after the millions of miles I have traveled around the world, with all that I have experienced, there, was, there is one great truth that I would share. That is my witness of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon recorded the following after a sacred experience. And now, after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony, last of all, which we give of him, that he lives, for we saw him. Their words are my words, unquote. Brothers and sisters, I think one would be hard-pressed to find a more potent, direct, modern witness of the Savior's living reality than the one President Packer shared with us. Others to whom the resurrected Christ showed himself, according to various written accounts, include the following. Martin Harris, 1827. Oliver Cowdery, 1829. Newell Knight, 1830. Lyman White, 1831. 
Orson F. Whitney, 1876, Heber J. Grant, 1883, John Taylor, sometime before 1888, Lorenzo Snow, 1898, George Q. Cannon, sometime before 1902, George F. Richards, 1906, Joseph F. Smith, 1918, David O. McKay, 1921, LeGrand Richards, 1926, Hugh B. Brown, 1975, and David B. Haight, 1989. Other elect souls have had sacred experiences with the Lord Jesus Christ. One stands out to me. Elder Melvin J. Ballard described the following occurrence while he was on the Fort Peck Reservation doing some missionary work with his brethren. Quote, I found myself one evening in the dreams of the night in that sacred building, the temple. After a season of prayer and rejoicing, I was informed that I should have the privilege of entering into one of those rooms to meet a glorious personage. And as I entered the door, I saw seated on a raised platform the most glorious being my eyes have ever beheld or that I ever conceived existed in all the eternal worlds. As I approached to be introduced, he arose, stepped forward, stepped toward me with extended arms, and he smiled as he softly spoke my name. Elder Ballard continues, If I shall live to be a million years old, I shall never forget that smile. He took me into his arms and kissed me, pressed me to his bosom, and blessed me until the marrow of my bones seemed to melt. When he had finished, I fell at his feet. As I bathed them with my tears and kisses, I saw the prince of the nails in the feet of the redeemer of the world. The feeling that I had in the presence of him who hath all things in his hands, to have his love, his affection, and his blessing was such that if I ever receive that of which I had but a foretaste, I would give all that I am, all that I ever hoped to be, to feel what I then felt. I see Jesus now, continues Elder Ballard, not upon the cross. I do not see his brow pierced with thorns nor his hands torn with the nails, but I see him smiling with extended arms saying to us all, Come unto me. President Ezra Taft Benson, 12th president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, offered this testimony that serves as a fitting summary and conclusion to our discussion of all modern witnesses. Quote, Since the day of resurrection, when Jesus became the first fruits of them that slept, there have been those who disbelieve and scoff, but I say unto you, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest historical event in the world to date. In this dispensation, commencing with the prophet Joseph Smith, the witnesses are legion. As one of those called as special witnesses, I add my testimony to those fellow apostles he lives. He lives with resurrected body. There is no truth which I am more assured or no better by personal experience than the truth of the literal resurrection of our Lord, unquote. Thank heaven, literally, thank heaven for the many pure and clear witnesses of our Savior's resurrected living reality, both ancient and modern. Because of the restored gospel, we know of the Savior's promise to all who keep their covenants. Quote, Verily thus saith the Lord, it shall come to pass that every soul who forsakes his sins and cometh unto me and calleth on my name and obeyeth my voice and keepeth my commandments, 
shall see my face and know that I am. I bear my personal witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, years ago, before there was even such a thing as a missionary training center, which you'll tell, should tell you just what a dinosaur I am, uh, missionaries going out to serve in their fields met in the old mission home where the conference center now stands. And we met for four days and we had uh, what would one, anyone would call a spiritual feast. On one of those days, we were uh, ushered over to the Salt Lake Temple, uh, walked four flights of stairs to the fourth floor of Solemn Assembly Room. And there we were told to wait patiently, we would be visited. And indeed, just a few minutes later, in walked President Harold B. Lee. And he said, because we're in the temple, you may ask any question that you like. Temple question or non-temple question. The tragedy, in my mind, of that circumstance was that I was so dumb, I couldn't even think of a question to ask. <laughs> I told that experience to my father-in-law one time, and he said, oh, youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> and so uh, uh, the missionaries in my cohort began asking President Lee questions. And a remarkable thing happened. He would take his scriptures, he would open them to a passage, and then he would respond to the question with words similar to, well, let's just see what the Lord has to say about that, or let's see what the revelations teach us, and he did that for every question. I remember up towards the front of the room, uh, a, a young, tall, blonde elder raised his hand and presently called on him and said, uh, you know, on the outside of the temple, it says, house of the Lord. You think he's ever visited here? I thought that was a wonderful question. But as I looked at President Lee, I began to think, well, maybe it wasn't so great. President Lee closed his scriptures, which had been open, pushed them to the side of the podium, and began to wag his finger at the elder. Oh, my. Oh, elder, he said. Do not ask if he has ever visited this temple. This is his house, and he walks these very halls. Uh, I confess I did not really hear anything else that happened in that meeting. I was stunned. I'd never heard of such a concept. I'd never thought of such a thing. The living Christ walks these very halls. And so from that day to this, I can tell you that I have gained my own witness of the living reality of Jesus Christ. And I pray that all of us who desire will be able to have those experiences that make us crave life with our heavenly parents more than anything else in the world. And I pray for that. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Andy, I now know how you feel and how it's unenvious to follow the BYU women's course. We're grateful for the messages uh, from Dr. Blumel and Dr. Pierce Prime and Dr. Skinner and have been greatly blessed by the talents of the BYU women's course and their director, Dr. Poulter. I personally would also like to thank the members of the Easter Committee for 2023 and 2024, Tracy Wright, Devin Jensen, Carmen Cole, Dr. David Calibro, and our incoming committee chair, Dr. Daniel Becerra, and especially all the student assistants for the energy and tireless efforts that they have given for this conference. All of them have been a blessing to me personally, and I hope that you feel the same. We all hope that you have been uplifted and encouraged to treasure the atoning sacrifice of our Savior and glory in his resurrection. It is our prayer that this Easter season, we may all see, know, recognize and stand as witnesses of the risen Christ in our own individual ways and echo the testimony of Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon that he lives, Christos Aneste. May the joy of the response, Alethos Aneste, and he is risen indeed, echo throughout our Easter weekend and the rest of our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our benediction will be offered by Sister Ruth Calibro, the wife of Dr. David Calibro, after which our conference will be adjourned. Our dear Father in heaven, we are indeed grateful, so thankful for the opportunity to gather and be taught by the Spirit and for the many gifts of testimony through music, word, art, and so many things that have come together to strengthen us. We are so thankful to thee for sending thy beloved Son to be our perfect example, to redeem us and bless us in so many ways. 
We're thankful for the resurrection and the atonement. We ask for thy help as we go forth that we will recognize and remember the witnesses of the spirit that we have received and share our witness and strengthen others that we can assist in gathering thy people unto Christ. With gratitude and humility, we say these things in the name of our Savior, the risen Christ. Amen. <laughs>